Good afternoon, everyone. Um, even if for some of you, it's good morning, uh, especially to our guest speakers who are based in the United States. Um, so you're very welcome to our roundtable on language education for sustainable development. And uh, we're very honored to host this roundtable in the context of the first uh, UNITAR research conference uh, on uh, climate security um, and peace, and also in collaboration with CIRCLES. Uh, so welcome to our colleagues uh, who are here in, in Bonn with us, and uh, also very much to all of you who have joined us online. Um, and we want to give a very special welcome to our guest speakers, um, Maria José de la Fuente, Owen Kloalen, uh, sorry Owen for the mispronunciation, uh, Seth Peabody and Kylie Cost. Uh, so they each come from a language teaching background and they have uh, ex extensive experience in uh, incorporating sustainability topics in their teaching practice or in their professional practice in general. So the number of people who registered uh, here uh, today and who turned up, we had uh, more than 50 people who registered from outside of TU Dublin. Um, it really shows that uh, colleagues in languages in particular have a, an interest in integrating sustainability into our language teaching practices. Um, so we all know the complexity that uh, uh, sustainability presents to us uh, to, and to teach the inter interdependencies between the different societal, environmental and economical aspects of sustainability. Um, you know, we face uh, big challenges to not just teaching the knowledge and skills that underpin sustainable development, but also uh, getting uh, a mindset change um, in general, so that students feel empowered to take action towards uh, implementing the SDGs. And it's uh, very important for us as language teachers uh, to get onto this journey and uh, assist our students uh, who will be working and living with this in their future. Uh, so I think we're going to learn a lot today and uh, before we introduce the speakers more specifically, I'd like to hand over to Carmen to say a brief a few words about Circles, uh, who we are doing this event in collaboration with, and um, who is going, we're going to uh, share your presentation, Carmen. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Odette. Thank you. Uh, I was uh, um, I disconnected before. Sorry for those few minutes. Uh, I was not with you, but uh, uh, can you hear me? Everything is okay. We can hear yeah. you. Can you see the slides Wonderful. that we're sharing for you? Unfortunately, I cannot see the slide uh, at the moment. Can you try again? Sorry. Okay. Share screen. Um, this is it. Share. Did you do that? Are you sharing the screen or is it the... That, okay. That's now. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Well, first of all, uh, thank you. Thank you for, I'm so happy to be here with all of you. Uh, with you, Odette and Pilar, um, it, it's nice to share this experience uh, with uh, the keynote speakers also in uh, sharing uh, around uh, such an important uh, um, topic, uh, language education for uh, sustainable development. And in fact, uh, this was uh, uh, the way and the, the reason why we, the three of us, met, met uh, two years ago, and it was within the circles context. So very brief, uh, a very brief introduction, presentation of circles. Uh, Sabina, Sabina Schaffen is our um, uh, circles president. She couldn't join us today, so greetings uh, from her. 
Uh, you will see in the next slide uh, just uh, general information about uh, uh, circles, uh, but I, I highlighted uh, those uh, uh, that I believe are the most uh, uh, relevant one. It was founded in 1991, so we can say that we have become a kind of uh, historic uh, confederation uh, uh, of language centers uh, uh, already by now. And uh, uh, Circles uh, involves uh, 400 institutions among language centers, departments, and faculties. And as you can imagine, our main research and is teaching and learning languages uh, and academic communication. We are 13. Uh -uh, there is uh, some, uh, uh, some type of mistakes over there. Thir 13 national association and 23 associate members. By associate members, we mean individual um, professionals who decide to join uh, circles uh, uh, autonomously, independently. And, and you can imagine that within these associations, uh, we have thousands uh, of uh, uh, people involved in so many different sectors, academic, administrative, technical. And as a consequence, uh, we work, uh, we deal with, uh, we want to share our experiences with uh, hundreds of thousands of students. Uh, uh, and convey our messages uh, to them. Circles, uh, circles in terms of research uh, on language education, uh, we tend to encourage international and interdisciplinary cooperation between language centers uh, um, and also multilingualism and social inclusion. Can we, we can move to the next uh, slide. Uh, this shows the strategic goals. So as I said before, the, our mission is this promotion of international interdisciplinary cooperation and research in so many applied linguistics and linguistics uh, uh, fields. We regularly organize meetups monthly, uh, on a monthly basis. This is when we want uh, teachers uh, and leaders uh, who work in uh, language centers uh, can share experiences, uh, um, uh, share ideas. Uh, and we also have uh, webinars uh, on research, best practices, uh, and uh, why not uh, ideas about further developments. Uh, as for conferences, I will tell you something more uh, in the final slide. Uh, we can move to the next one. Uh, this is just a selection of the webinars uh, or some webinars uh, that we uh, organized in 2023. As you can see, um, current topics uh, like artificial intelligence in the language classroom, machine translation, without forgetting, of course, uh, more traditional but so relevant ones uh, like the European language portfolio that in, enhances uh, uh, autonomous learning and, uh, and uh, self-evaluation. We also, we also had a very, very interesting uh, webinar on COIL formats, uh, this cooperation uh, in, inter of international language online. But I highlighted the one I feel with very close to, and this is the context where I had the chance to meet uh, um, Pilar and Odette, uh, a circles journal, language learning and higher education. Uh, twice a year, in fact, we organize a very dynamic webinar where we, we meet the authors through interviews. And the authors, uh, they all belong to different, uh, to different countries. Uh, this, the last time we had uh, somebody from Finland, Germany, Portugal, and Switzerland. And we focused on interesting uh, topics, uh, their publications, uh, um, digital storytelling, uh, and so many, so many others. Uh, oh, that's okay, <laughs> that's okay. I was just uh, mentioning collaborative learning as well, academic writing, dialogic co-creation. Obviously, if you want to see this, to watch these webinars, uh, you can, uh, um, you can find them on the circle, so you YouTube channel. So 
Okay, we can move to the next one. Uh, this is about our circles, uh, our journal. Circles journal is a very dynamic uh, um, reality. Uh, these are the issues that we published in the past uh, three years. So we published uh, two issues uh, per year. And here, I obviously wanted to highlight the special section that we, that we dedicated to education for sustainable de development. That was back to October 2022, uh, when uh, Odette and Pilar were our guest uh, editors. Um, there, in this, to this journal, we welcome research articles uh, as well. Uh, very practical activity reports. Uh, so you're more than welcome to um, visit the Greuther website uh, to, um, to know more about it. Uh, we can move to the next uh, slide. Uh, these are just uh, some of the topics. Uh, yeah, you can go very fast with that. Uh, some of the topics uh, covered uh, in issue uh, 13, uh, the latest uh, issues. So you will see interculturality again, students' perception, EMI, a uh, comparison of EMI experiences in different countries like Vietnam and Turkey, and then uh, digital presentations, uh, corpora used uh, in the language classroom, online exams, uh, tasks for engineers, so in other words, also lots of language for special purposes. Um, we're almost at the end with the next uh, slide, where, uh, okay, where, uh, yes, so we're going to meet the Circles community, it's a nice community, actually, I've seen that there is uh, um, uh, Mark Richley uh, today with us, and then our friend from Pro Poznań, from po uh, Poland. Um, next September, we're going to meet in, uh, we will be in Durham, all of us in at Durham University. Uh, you see the title, the topic there. Um, there will be you, there will be keynotes, workshops, uh, poster sessions, uh, and we change every two years. Uh, we change the country in Europe. In 2016, uh, it was in uh, in Italy, in Calabria, in fact. Uh, but then we were in Poznań, that, uh, right after in Poland, and Brno, and Porto, Portugal, and next uh, next uh, September in. Uh, in the UK. So we are, uh, uh, we really hope uh, you will, uh, um, will be interested in joining us. And uh, okay, in the final slide, you can find uh, the Circles uh, website uh, address. Uh, please uh, visit it. Uh, we will be happy if you join us, as I said before, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Carmen, for uh, this uh, interesting overview of circles and of the journal. So I'm going to briefly introduce our speakers, and then we will start with uh, our conversation around susten susten sustainability literacy. So Maria Jose de la Fuente is a Spanish and applied linguistic linguistics professor at George Washington University. Maria Jose has been working on sustainability education since 2014. She recently published the edited volume entitled Education for Sustainable Development in Foreign Language Learning. Kylie is a lecturer in German at Carleton College with a PhD in Germanic Studies, specializing in environmental humanities and Ecocriticism. Kylie co created the online resource platform Environment and Engagement in German Studies. She is dedicated to integrating environmental thinking into her, into her teaching at all levels. Owen is an environmentalist who integrates sustainability into language teaching. Since 2012, he runs ELT sustainable.org and leads teaching sorry and leads teacher development projects worldwide. 
With a background in English teaching, he now works at Bangor University, emphasizing EdTech and education for sustainability. And lastly, Seth is an assistant professor of, Ger of German at Carle Carleton College, specializing in the intersections of environmental humanities and German language, literature and film. His publications include a newly released monograph entitled Film History for the Anthropos Anthropocene, the Ecological Archive of German Cinema. So thank you to you four to join us uh, in this round table. And I will start with uh, the first question, uh, the most basic question. So what is sustainability? literacy and how does it relate to language teaching and learning? So I don't know if Maria Jose, would you like to start <laughs> answering? Hi everyone uh, from Washington DC. Um, so this is a basic question, but you know, for a lot of language instructors, it's not that uh, clear what is sustainability literacy. So I will define it in terms of um, higher education and what type of literacy, uh, student, an undergraduate student should leave the university with. Uh, and and uh, at this I was going to say that yesterday I found out that Indiana University has made it a requirement of all students at the university, regardless of the schools, that they uh, need to graduate having a sustainability literacy uh, corpus or amount of classes they need to take on sustainability so that every single graduate from Indiana has sustainability literacy. So I think that was that was great. I, I found that yesterday and I thought that's wonderful and every university should have that in my opinion. But so the sustainability literacy that um, student uh, in, in higher education should have is, is all the collection of knowledge, um, skills or competencies also called, but also in mindsets that um, they should have so so they can uh, they can participate effectively um, in local but also global conversations regarding the challenges we are facing today in the world and hopefully when they graduate and they enter the professional life they can um, contribute to solve some of these problems and, and develop sustainable um, innovative solutions to these problems. So. I would say that uh, a sustainability literate student should have, first of all, the knowledge of um, what's the system of sustainability and understand sustainability as more than just uh, environmental or ecological um, aspects, which I think is still to this day, I see it in my classroom. Uh, when, when my classroom, when my class starts and I ask the students, what's sustainability? They, most of them uh, equated to environmental issues. Um, but, um, in, and it's true that, that that's a very important part of sustainability, but there are also economic and social factors that are um, part of the equation. And those three, economic, environmental, and social, are in a constant interaction. So um, students should know that uh, historically those interactions have not been positive. Um, most of the time, many times, economic factors have superseded the other two and so that model has brought us where we are today um, in, a, in a world that is a, a model of, of a world that is not sustainable. Um, second, um, they should understand that um, we are in this unsustainable trajectory and what type of social structure has contributed to this. And, and, and of course, therefore understand um, that there is a need for change. Um, change on the way um, we do things and um, doing things sustainable, both at the individual level and the collective level. Um, and finally, they need to have uh, enough capacities or competencies to, to be able to analyze problems. So hopefully when they go to the, the professional uh, life, they can contribute, as I said before. Um, it's understood always that these competencies are of three types. Uh, one of them is uh, at the level of cognitive um, competencies. For example, um, they should be able to approach uh, problems, sustainability problems from a systems perspective, or multiple aspects interacting. They should be able to think critically. They should be able to have to be creative in solving problems. 
uh, they should um, be able to assess what impact um, some of these solutions may have in 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 you know in the world. Um, be able to anticipate um, the consequences of decisions they may envision for solving sustainability problems. But there is also a level of, I would say, it's an emotional level in a way. For example, to and it has to be because with, with intercultural competence, I feel able to be able to to feel concern, to 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 feel empathy, and to respect different people and different ways of living of other people, appreciate multiple perspectives of seeing the world, um, different people from different backgrounds, um, motivations, etc., and also commit to a model of sustainability that is based on equity. Is based on inclusivity and overall respect for other people. Um, the third aspect is that, as I said before, when they graduate, or even before, when they are still in college, they are able to develop solutions to, to problems uh, at the university level, at the local level, and hopefully later on um, at the global level. Um, in terms of... Oh, what are the connections um, of sustainability to language education, to language teaching? There are multiple connections, but I just want to briefly talk about two. Um, I talked before about how these students should be able later to engage in global conversations regarding the problems uh, the world is facing, because sustainability problems are, um, uh, are, are problems that need to be solved collectively. They, they cannot be solved um, uh, only individually. So for these, the most important connection is that in order to participate in this conversation at the global level, students need to be able to manage one or more foreign languages. Um, English is no longer the, the lingua franca uh, of sustainability dialogues. Uh, in my case, I've studied Latin America for a long time, and those dialogues most of the time involve uh, the use of Spanish. Uh, so they need to have that foreign language proficiency. They need to have cultural understanding, which comes first from the study of a foreign language. And um, so merging language learning and sustainability seems like a natural fit, um, a natural strategy to obtain students who are both high competent language uh, bilinguals or multilinguals, and also students with sustainability knowledge and, and awareness. The second, and I finish with that, is that um, there is a natural fit at the pedagogical level between language learning and teaching and uh, education for sustainable development. They both favor um, uh, learner-centered approaches to teaching. They favor instructional approaches that are um, based on active learning, um, foreign language learning, for example, task-based, problem-based pedagogy, community-based learning. Those are the same pedagogies that education for sustainability uses. And um, so they both share this pedagogical um, framework, and that makes it very easy for us language instructors to adopt, uh, to, in, to infuse our classes with sustainability content. Um, and and the, the, I'll leave it right here for now, so I'll have other people say something else about it. Thank you so much. Would any one of our speakers would like to add anything to to this understanding of uh, sustainability in language learning and teacher teaching? Sorry. Otherwise, will. Okay. Thank you, Maria Jose. Um, Maybe the next question that we would like to ask is whether uh, you could provide some examples of e effective sustainability literacy practices in language education. Um, so uh, do you do you have examples of language teaching that supports the development of educational sustainability uh, education for sustainable development skills, values, knowledge, um, anything in that in that field? Um, maybe Kylie, would you like to start on that? Yeah, thank you. And I, I would have added on to Maria Jose, except for my answers here do add on to that because there's so many connections here. For examples of effective practices, I wanted to talk about something that Seth and I came up with. Seth is my colleague. I'm usually on the other side of his 
office, but I'm working from home today. So, um, But we came up with this model that we call critical environmental thinking, where you're combining environmental thinking with critical thinking and doing it in the language class classroom. And what this model is, is a way of getting students to connect their everyday lives and everyday practices to these larger environmental questions. It's a way to kind of sit with and think about large scale topics that impact them every single day, or maybe that they haven't really realized that impact them every day. But the main intervention here is that in our field of German studies, Green Germany has been this template, this model for teaching about sustainability in the language classroom, starting from 2000, the year 2000, after they had the renewable energy law passed. And since then, it's been, oh, Germany is a model for sustainable development. Germany is a model for environmental policy. But all of those things are so far away from our students' reality. Um, our, we, Seth and I teach in the US, in Minnesota. Our students are 18 to 22 years old. They're not making policy decisions yet. I mean, maybe in the future. So that can feel really far away. The scale is misaligned from their everyday life to these big technological solutions or policy discussions that doesn't really Im impact them every day. And Odette said at the beginning, we want our students to take action. What can they do right now as a 19 year old in Minnesota or in Bonn or some somewhere else? And Maria Jose said, it's a mindset we want them to, to adopt or to change. And that's what critical environmental thinking is. So how can we get you right now to think about how your actions are contributing to these larger problems? And now a specific example. And every, okay, maybe I shouldn't say that, but in many beginning language classes, you, you learn about food, you learn about cultural practices around food, you learn about grocery stores maybe, and this is a place where we can intervene and really look at, okay, where does food come from? So this is my favorite example, and I just got to do it I think last month I've been teaching just German 101, the first German class in our sequence. And when we learned about food, the students first all searched for grocery stores in German speaking countries. And then they found the online flyers where you can click through and see what food is for sale. And we looked at the produce, the fruits and vegetables, and we asked, oh, where are these blueberries from? This was in a German grocery store in October and the blueberries were from Peru. That's a very long way for a small carton of blueberries to travel. So we kind of triangulated food origins. And this gets them thinking about, oh, yeah, where did my apple come from that I ate today? Um, and we talked about food in the dining halls on our campus and where that food came from. So you can do the same with it's really any beginning language topic when you think about transportation, when you think about city development, when you think about uh, daily routines, where are your clothes from, how many t-shirts do you have, all of these examples you can build into the language classroom. And I'll just say what's really important when we're thinking about critical environmental thinking is that it's not a one-way cultural street. It's not we're in German class, so we're going to learn about Germany. And it's not even a two-way street of compare U.S. to Germany. It's using the language that we're learning, the target language, to think very, very broadly and expansively about all of these uh, connections between places and items and personal lives. In the U.S., we have a lot of international students, and it's great because they can bring in perspectives that are missing when you're just talking, oh, U.S. and Germany and thinking that there's this bicultural exchange. It's so much more than that. And I'll finish with just another example, because in my German 101 class this term, we had students giving a presentation about the city of Bonn, actually. So this yeah. is a great, <laughs> a great connection. And they were talking about the UN climate conference that happens in Bonn. One student was from California and the other was from Lahore, Pakistan. And both of them said, this is how climate change is impacting my life in California or my life in Pakistan. And they can do that with very basic German skills because it is a very basic thing. 
we all were talking about the weather when we logged on here. The sun is shining in my eyes right now. It's all this basic cultural and everyday knowledge where we can intervene. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank very, you. very interesting. Um, anybody else to add their experiences on, on that question or their practices? I would like just to say, well, that's wonderful what Kyle is doing. Um, I've been involved mostly with um, advanced level of language learning and how working through problem-based uh, problem learning, you can contribute to solve uh, sustainability problems, etc. I've never worked at the basic levels of language education. And I find it really, first of all, I think it should be so much fun to do materials and classes around this topic. Some people say, oh, sustainability is so complex. You can only work with that in advanced levels of language learning, but it's, it's not true. I mean, she, she gave examples of how you can have the students thinking about sustainability, even in, in German or Spanish or French 101. So that's, that's fantastic. I would also like to say something because I teach uh, at Poznan University of Technology, I teach students of logistics and we have uh, also topics on transporting fresh produce, for example. So this is something that Kylie was talking about. So uh, how long does it take <coughs> to, uh, to, I don't know, transport bananas from the Canary Islands to Poland? Uh, how many people does it involve? Uh, what uh, different conditions need to be taken into account, right? So uh, this is also quite um, interesting. Thank you. Um, could I add something which is, I completely agree with what Kylie is saying, that there was always this tradition in the past that you'd have all these different uh, units in a course book, you'd have your food one, your clothes, your transport, and then unit 12 would be the environment one, which typically people didn't really want to do, both teachers and students. And But actually, when you look at it, you can usually embed sustainability into every topic. And like the examples Kylie gave about food, and I'm thinking of a transport lesson I did with very... Um, with learners who just started learning English and and it involved a very simple um, infogram which showed the sort of CO, CO2 uh, footprints of various types of um, transport and it was such a really nice way for people at A2 level um, in their language learning to, to start using comparatives. Um, and a great way to base a, a lesson on transport around with a sustainability twist. Yes, that's that's very interesting and it's true that sustainability should be embedded in all uh, different uh, language uh, topics. And this is bringing us to our next uh, question. Um, what are the key challenges and opportunities in, integra in integrating sustainable literacy into language teaching curricula? And perhaps, uh, Owen, you may like to start uh, answering to the question. Sure, yes. Um, I, on First on my list is um, the students. And um, I don't think I, and perhaps we, really know our student needs as well as we think we might do. Um, in the institutions I've worked with, they've typically researched students' needs and they've come to these very sort of instrumentalist reasons for learning English that are typically based on career or education. Um, and interestingly, um, a year ago I was working in Algeria and I decided to interview um, three or four randomly picked students um, about their attitudes to environmental matters in class. And the overall picture was that it was really positive, that they really felt that it should be in the syllabus and should be in their syllabuses more than it was. Um, and they came from a variety of backgrounds, um, whether it was one of them installing solar panels in desert villages, another was in the oil industry, but they all felt that it should be 
a bigger part in their language learning experience. Um, and so I, I think certainly I need want to know more about my students' needs and trying to get them to find how to get sustainable sustainability into courses in a way that really engages them. Um, another challenge, and I think this can be a greater challenge, is um, to what extent teachers buy into bringing sustainability into um, language education. Um, when I first started with my website, it was very much lesson plans for people who wanted to bring sustainability into their classes. And now the way I see things going, it's beginning to be at more of an institutional level where uh, sustainability is brought in at the syllabus level. Teachers may not have the same choice in integrating it. And ha so how in that situation do you get them to um, all teachers to buy into it? And to give an example of, of the extent of this, um, a, someone I know did some interesting research on English teachers in Portugal to find out their views on should they as language teachers bring in um, environmental issues into the language classroom. And even though they might have felt very, very strongly about environmental issues in their personal life, they felt it, generally felt that it was beyond their remit to bring that into their language classroom. Um, so, yeah, um, getting teachers to feel that it is something they should be doing in their classes and is, I think, is a challenge. Um, in sort of very practical experience, I found that institution buy-in, it's important. It's typically there on paper. Um, however, um, at the moment, I'm trying to bring in the global goals into um, a pathways college syllabus. And while the support is there, actually getting the time to bring it in can be a big challenge, especially when you've got sort of day-to-day -day urgent things that have to be um, dealt with, um, as well as crowded syllabuses, teaching to very specific outcomes that are based on assessments that may not yet have um, sustainability literacy in, which makes me very impressed by what Maria is saying about um, where it has been brought in. Um, so those are, are, are challenges. Um, key opportunities, um, I think we've got education is such a powerful tool um, and that includes language teaching. And I think, um, I don't know about broader languages, but certainly English language teaching tends to see itself as a little bit outside of general education. It's, um, again, this sort of instrumentalist view of learning. Um, a great, um, someone who I greatly admire, David Orr, talked about um, education is the solution, but it's going to have to be a very different form of education um, and how that will work in in language teaching is an interesting question. Um, typically, as language teachers, we, we are always conscious of bringing language into realistic context um, that mimics the real life use that students will use it. And sustainability is, has such an opportunity there because it transcends borders, an international problem, um, in which knowing language is, is such a key part of it. Um, and then another thing um, that I find interesting is that sustainability has been accused of sort of being in very single discipline silos. Um, and I think possibly um, I and the English language teaching profession has been a little bit guilty of that. And I think there's a real opportunity that between different um, language teaching, different languages, there could be a lot more overlap. So for example, like we are here today, all teaching different languages, I think there's a great room for exchange of um, knowledge here. So I think those are my main points I'd like to make. Um,
happy to add to them if there's questions. It's very interesting. I'd love to be in a less formal situation to be able to have a, a free conversation around this. And uh, but um, maybe and the, the the whole aim of this uh, roundtable was to give the floor very much to you, guest speakers. So anybody else here that would like to contribute to what Owen has said. I would like to add briefly um, um, that um, a big challenge, like Owen um, mentioned, is to, to have departments of language from us buy into, he used that expression, sustainability. When I was working on, on my edited volume, I was looking for what was going on in other departments, in other places in the U.S. Um, related to sustainability in the teaching of languages. What I found is that people are working alone. I found German instructors, uh, instructors of Spanish, of French, of Russian, and they were all, most of them, they were working alone. They were not working in integrating sustainability at a curricular level. Uh, most of their colleagues were not interested in, in making changes to the language curriculum. And so I found very little in terms of, you know, um, sustainability integrated into a language curriculum. What I found more is, People who loved the, the theme, they they really thought this was important, and they were doing their own thing. Like me, I'm I'm, I'm working on my classes on my own. Uh, my department doesn't have many sustainability uh, courses at this point, um, so it's a very lonely um, experience <laughs> so far, so far. And I think buying into the importance of this at the foreign language learning level is so important. I might add, I'll talk about this in a second on, in regards to specific programs, but even the ones that seem to be doing really well um, and having a curriculum wide impact. I've, I have heard anecdotes about the resistant colleagues who feel like you're forcing something upon them. So, um, so figuring out, I guess, what, how to build those networks kind of so that people do buy in individually, but then also what is the scale at which it feels like I'm not pressuring you into something that I don't have the right to pressure you to do. Um, those are questions that I think are pretty mm. unique to each situation. Okay, so that brings us nicely onto the next question, which is um, whether you're uh, aware of, uh, or how, have you got experience of any successful models or examples of, of schools or programs uh, that have effectively integrated sustainability literacy into their language curriculum. And I think one of the reasons why we're asking this question at this point of time is uh, a little bit selfish because we are at a cross point or at a point at which uh, in TU Dublin, we are very lucky that we one of the strategic pillars for the university is sustainability. The other one is partnership and the other one is planet. So they're very much aligned to uh, the sustainability agenda. And now we have this uh, challenge at uh, faculty level, school level, programmatic level to actually make this a reality and embed the sustainability agenda into our programs. So uh, so we're interested to hear about your experience and um, whether you have some uh, good examples that we could get inspiration from in that respect. And, and Seth, I think you uh, might have a few things to say about that. Sure, thank you. Um, so to start out, I guess, I'm, I want to note that my examples are all from German studies in the United States, which is a pretty specific context. And it's colored by this um, specific background Kylie mentioned, where there's very much sort of a de deficit mindset that like Germany is doing wonderful things and the US must learn from Germany, kind of setting up students to sort of think about it in one directional ways. Um, and we and lots of the colleagues we think together with have been trying to help students kind of get more expansive in their approach to the issue. Um, and to do that, I think a lot of what we'd, we've heard already has been really important. So just thinking back to Maria Jose's um, comments at the beginning that it's not just about individual issues, there needs to be kind of cultural understanding as one of the foundations, and then it has to be active and engaged and problem-based. Um, and 
Odette talked about that at the beginning, also a mindset change. So students feel empowered to take action. And Kylie was giving examples that like that can happen in every class simply through the curation of texts and in certain ways so that the same basic language elements you learn in every class are then applied to sustainability issues. Um, so with all of this background, I'm going to share just sort of a handful of programs I've seen that do it well. Um, this comes from a couple of things. One is um, Kylie and I, together with a colleague, Dan Nolan, at the University of Minnesota Duluth, co-edited a, a special section of the journal Teaching German, Die Unterrichtspraxis, in it's the kind of U.S. pedagogy journal for German, where we just got a bunch of case studies from colleagues. I've also been a co-director of the Environmental Studies Network of the German Studies Association, which is largely based in North America, and just kind of seen a lot of different programs. So... The one maybe that Kylie and I both know the best is the University of Minnesota. It's a huge, um, huge university here in Minnesota, um, something like 60,000 students total at all levels. Um, and so they can have a big impact. And for until quite recently, they had a chair of the department, Charlotte Moline, who was very invested in these issues. She um, recently edited a volume on foreign language teaching in the environment, theory, curricula, institutional structures that kind of brought together um, a bunch of uh, solid case studies. Beth Kautz was working with her, is still working at the University of Minnesota. And because the two of them were really invested in this, they were able to do some exciting things. Um, individual courses in both German and English at sort of advanced seminar level. Um, but also Beth Kautz created a whole second year curriculum. And so all the thousands of students who are going through this university's language program would get this second year curriculum built around sustainability as the main issue. So to me, from the outside, that looks like a wonderful success story. And then as I got to talking to Beth about it, she described exactly the issues Owen was describing, where they have, she has kind of a whole bunch of teachers she works with in, in coordinating this, this language program who feel like she's kind of forcing something on them and they have fun ways of teaching language that they've always done and want to keep doing. Um, and so that was a bit of a struggle, but also I think a good outcome despite that. Second example, at Georgia Tech, um, Britta Kalin is a colleague that I've worked with a few times and she um, prior to 2020 had spent five years integrating with her colleagues in German, integrating the sustainability development goals from the UN into their German curriculum at all levels from beginning German up to their master level courses. Um, and in 2020, that date's important because that's when the president of the university as a whole decided that the whole university will do this and put it into all classes. And so that's one of the things we're hearing is, can we embed this throughout? Um, and so that happened, but it was something they'd already been pushing within their German program. So um, that's sort of a, an example where it started with just a few people, but it then expanded to be institution-wide. Um, a sort of smaller example, just based on the scale someone could work with, at Appalachian State University in the United States, Beverly Moser is a professor who integrated a climate stories project. So climate stories is something that she didn't create, ex exists kind of on the internet. Lots of students and authors create their own climate story. Um, but she was able to integrate that also into all of their levels and throughout the German curriculum. So whatever, whatever level students can, can use the language at, that's the kind of story they could either think about or tell. Um, and then one of the things that I find exciting about her program is they would then put on a sort of exhibit for the whole campus. And this is something I've seen at a lot of different, um, different institutions is students and uh, teachers sort of start, professors start within a language program, but then find a way to use that as a venue for, um, for working with the whole campus and building a bigger conversation. Um, and two more. So Dan Nolan up at the University of Minnesota Duluth has uh, a green or a sustainability in German speaking countries course that he has done uh, several times. And it is based around an academic civic engagement project where students work with local partners, nonprofits and businesses who are involved in sustainability in some way, or who want to make their business more sustainable. And the students then do research projects where they find German examples doing similar things. And they talk to the German partners and the partners in Duluth, Minnesota, to kind of build this international conversation around sustainability in a specific context of a business or a, a specific environmental goal. Um, 
So, but what's really made Dan's project work is that the University of Minnesota already had a project called the Climate Smart Municipalities Program, where they had set up networks between Minnesota cities and German cities to kind of get larger conversations going. And so Dan could quickly find partners on both sides who are interested. Um, so that's one of the recurring themes is kind of these networks that already exist and plugging the language courses into them. And then um, just finally, Kylie and I at Carleton, I feel like a couple of things might be worth maybe reiterating. So Car Kylie talked already about at the language level, at the level of even first year language, simply thinking about, yes, students always learn these questions of how to talk about themselves, how to ask questions, how to describe location. Where is it from? Where are you from? Asking where is the food from is the same kind of a question they always ask in a language class, but it leads to this thinking about sustainability. Um, and she talked about this, the project students are doing about Bonn in, at the end of their first term of German. That came from a similar thought where we, um, we have a textbook we use that doesn't do this as deliberately as we tried to, um, but we thought about how can we make the students work already in first year German, more, think, more focused on social change, on the issues that are crucial for them. Um, and so we did something that's pretty standard, like talk about a place in a German speaking country, but usually this winds up being presentations about Oktoberfest or other tourist sites. Um, so we just made the slight change of saying, you have to think about social change. You have to think about cities as dynamic sites of contestation, of social justice, of hopefully progress, but also problems and think about the city in these more complex terms but use the same sentences you would use anyway in first year German. So who am I? So you're sort of pretending to be a tour guide through the city. So just talk about yourself. And then where are we going? Talk about location. What are we going to eat? Where does that food come from? Talk about food. So kind of the vocabulary units, the, the grammar are the same things that they always get in a first year class, but thinking about what is a context that makes this somehow a sustainability or a social change related uh, topic. So I think that, um, there, and then there are other skills also sort of at the institutional or at the meta institutional level, Kylie and I, and I are involved in a couple of networks working in German studies as a whole. Um, so I think to wrap it all up, what are the, what are the methods? How do people get these things done? One is simply leadership, like having one really enthusiastic, energetic colleague makes a big difference. Charlotte Moline in Minnesota, Peter Colleen in Georgia, lots of others have made a much bigger difference than just these individuals. Um, building on existing structures and local um, fit, lo local energies that already exist can be really important. So this institutional thing at Georgia Tech was crucial. The, um, the programs that already had an exchange going in Minnesota, that was really helpful. Um, thinking about multiple scales and multiple levels. So from the beginning German level to the advanced level, and also um, thinking about what are our professional networks in the German Studies Association in kind of sustainability activism across Minnesota. There are lots of different directions that all can kind of be put into alignment with each other, can benefit from each other. And then from there, how can you do outreach? Who can you share your stories with on campus, online? Um, usually all of these at the same time. So I think I'll leave it at that. Those are sort of a handful of examples, some very local, some from broader networks here. Great examples. Um, would anyone have other examples to share? Um, when I said before, I was thinking about this, I said before, most of the examples I found around the US, it, it was hard for me to find contributors to, to this volume because I found that overall, not many people were still working on sustainability at the, at the course or the curricular level. But interestingly enough, all the examples I found of integration of sustainability into the curriculum were from the German language. Which I think I think German departments are far ahead from from all other <laughs> language departments in this endeavor. But in the in the edited book that I published, I want to just show it here. Um, I'm not trying to <laughs> sell you the book. This book is available actually as an open source, so everybody can read it for free. I decided to publish it to publish it uh, open source. It's in the Rowlett's um, website. But I found. Two very interesting projects. One also in German in Texas Tech, 
where they start the project to you know basically introduce and integrate sustainability in the curriculum by Alec Cattell and Belinda Kleinhans. I'm not sure I pronounce it this well, but that project is described here. And also Duke University in North Carolina has a very interesting and difficult different time of uh, integration where they are working um, in what they when what is called cultures and languages across across the curriculum or CLAC. So what they are doing is partnerships with other departments to offer courses sustainability related taught in French, in Spanish, in German. So this is a different model, but it's also very, very, uh, it's worth taking a look at it. And I think Duke University is way far ahead than any other place in the US in this type of curriculum, um, you know, interdisciplinary collaborations. They have a school of environmental studies right now. And of course that has allowed them to establish a lot of collaborations already with professors there, but also with geography professors, um, climate experts, et cetera, et cetera. So those are two, two different examples of what you can do at the curricular level. Yeah. I, I want to add something to that. Thank you. Just two things. One is simply that these was a this was a very small and somewhat random sample. There are many in German to some extent and, that's and. based on this sense that somehow that's marketable and German departments can benefit from that. So I, I, it's not entirely somehow altruism and trying to save the world. Um, but I think there's still value to it. The second thing is online. Um, we've already heard a little bit about COIL, Collaborative Online International Learning, and that's a type of exchange that I think is growing a lot and has a lot of potential for kind of especially making this kind of work exciting without requiring constant air travel. And, and here we have an interesting uh, message, uh, just moving on to Europe a little bit because things are, are happening also in Europe. And um, Joe says, we Italian at Warwick have also used the students as co-creators on short summer internships to help collate and design ESD teaching resources based on local Italian context. For example, drawing on their experiences abroad. So, so that's good to see that also there are uh, activities and projects uh, going on um, in the universities in, in Europe. And okay, let's move on now to talk about uh, strategies. Um, are there specific strategies or resources other than those available for general ESD that language educators can use to incorporate sustainability principles into their lessons? And uh, perhaps Maria Jose, you may like to, to start this one. I'm muted. I'm mute. Okay, I'm on mute now. Um, in terms of resources, um, my my initial um, finding about after doing research uh, on this topic is that there are not that many research, resources, language specific related. Um, what I found is most of them, most of the resources available, belong to the English language teaching uh, sphere like our website, which I didn't know before and I've been looking at, and it's a wonderful website. I just listed there a few examples of resources that are online, uh, along with the Charlotte Mellin um, edited book that, that um, I totally forgot about your name and I apologize, <laughs> mentioned uh, the professor from, from Minnesota, um, and also my own uh, edited volume. Not many resources. Um, Strategies are uh, many. I think for me, at the very least, one of uh, the best uh, pedagogical strategy to, to in insert sustainability in language courses at the intermediate and advanced levels, maybe even at the, you know, an A2 level, like a high, high elementary, is uh, problem-based language learning. Um, it's a, there is a perfect natural synergy between um, sustainability problems and problem-based language learning, which is basically studying a problem and finding solutions to it. And it could be something as, as simple as, you know, water consumption in your dormitory is very high. You give students some of the samples of how water consumption is um, 
is working in the, in the dorm, and then the students have to find ways to reduce water consumption in their own dorm. That's, that's something that can be done at the probably high elementary intermediate level. And at the advanced level, which is where, I, where I've been working, um, you can basically work with case studies, any, any real case studies where you find problems that are multiple, there are hundreds of problems all over the world of unsustainable practices. So you present the students with the case placed in a region or a country, what's going on, um, and the students analyze, study the, the, the case and try to develop uh, potential solutions while they learn all the competencies that I mentioned before, right? Like um, um, being able to solve a problem that doesn't cause another problem, um, keeping to ethical and, and justice-wise um, um, decisions that uh, don't affect a, equality or, or people's rights. Um, so there are many different ways you can do with, with cases. Case studies are used in education for sustainable development. That's the main pedagogical tool ESD uses to educate students. So in language learning, we have already worked with problem-based language learning. Task-based pedagogy is a type of problem-based pedagogy, right? So um, I think that's probably one of the best ways as a, as a, in terms of strategies that somebody can develop materials is um, looking for cases of unsustainable practices. Again, you can work from my, your own home to problems in Latin America, exploitation of natural resources, et cetera. And one last thing I wanted to say is that, um, again, some people think, well, I'm not an expert in environmental issues, um, but language instructors, they may not be experts uh, on environmental issues, but they certainly are, are very um, well-versed on social issues affecting the countries who, uh, whose language they are teaching. So you can, uh, working in, in sustainability doesn't mean always to work about water consumption or, or the conservation of the environment. You can work about um, inequality and how it affects countries where, where your language is spoken. You can um, work with um, goals like um, a decent job for all, uh, the need for people to have decent jobs. Um, you can work with um, the role of the mother language in sustainable societies, how important it is to teach kids in their in their mother languages in their first years. Um, so any issue uh, of social justice and equity, I think foreign language instructors are familiar with this area and they can very well build that in their curriculum. So it doesn't have to be just environmental um, aspects of sustainability. Some language instructors I found they feel more comfortable working with uh, social justice topics, for example. And the UN uh, goals for 2030, uh, among their 17 goals, a lot of them, I don't remember how many, are addressing uh, social sustainability issues, um, like poverty, for example, which is also environmental and economic, but it's mainly a social phenomenon or um, as I said, uh, migration is another topic that you can work with, how migration is impacting sustainable development and the current policies on immigration are totally unsustainable and they need to change, uh, et cetera. So those, this is what I could say and in terms of strategies. And I, I again, I posted a few researches, uh, uh, resources, sorry, that I found important, but uh, other than English as a second or foreign language, very little, very few resources to find available to instructors. Unfortunately, the, in Spanish, there is a total um, um, lack of, of resources, almost total lack of resources to teach Spanish, for example. Mm -hmm. If I could add to that, um, so, I mean, I've just seen in the chat from uh, Juliana that I think it's a common um, feeling among some teachers that they're interested in sustainability, but it's not yet in the curriculum. And most likely teachers like Juliana are the ones who are going to start it in their um, institutions. And then as time goes on, the institution sees the benefit and will typically look for ways to bring it into the 
curriculum, and that will typically be with um, mapping the global goals to a syllabus and maybe using the sustainability competencies as a way to assess it. Um, and as you were saying, Maria, it's so important the skills that teachers have, um, language teachers in particular. To give a very clear example of this, I was recently talking in a conference with about a lesson I'd done on the benefits of cycling. And I was very pleased with my lesson. I, I felt it was really good. And there was a, a teacher from South Africa and said, look, this lesson just can't work in South Africa. It's too dangerous for me to cycle home in Cape Town. And that's something that I would never have known. And probably top-down implementation of sustainability wouldn't pick up. So it's obviously vital that we have teachers highly engaged. And my question is, how do you then get um, the, the majority of teachers engaged once you are trying to map um, sustainability and as I feel that it's vital for that to happen if it's going to work? Mm -hmm. Any hey, thoughts that people have? It's something I'm dealing with at the moment. <laughs> yes, I think uh, we're in a similar boat. <laughs> Um, maybe I'll ask the last question, because I see time is moving on, um, and it kind of uh, connects with the previous que question in the sense that we would like to know if you have any uh, further advice or recommendations for language teachers who are starting to explore uh, sustainability literacy in their teaching practices. So uh, I think, and, and thank you, by the way, for posting uh, so much into the chat, so many resources and ideas. Um, I think it's really going to contribute to that very last question, um, uh, as well as to the general uh, information that we'll be able to hopefully uh, circulate more widely um, after this uh, discussion. So, um, um, maybe uh, I don't know if Kylie has some insights to share. Hopefully. <laughs> I'm sure you have. Hopefully I do. And it, it goes off of what Owen was just talking about. And it's been a broader theme, the, the buy-in, but I'm kind of stubborn when it comes to this. And you can't tell me that sustainability isn't already in every single class, but it may just not be the thing that you're thinking of as sustainability. If you talk about a city, well, we need to talk about sustainability. If you talk about housing, we need to talk about sustainable housing and then the social justice issue of homelessness. I mean, it's already there. All of these intersections with sustainability are there. So you just have to tweak the way you approach them. And that's my stubbornness. So if I had, I'm lucky to have incredible colleagues, you see one of them here, and they're on board. But if I had a colleague that wasn't on board, I think I would say, well, housing is an environmental and social issue. So talk about it. <laughs> Maybe uh, I hope everyone can take some of my stubbornness from this. But to be to be maybe a little bit more um, flexible and give advice besides just do it. Um, I would say that it's really important to th be thinking broadly about how you can incorporate environmental thinking at all levels. It's been really great to have Maria talk about upper level classes um, and we have all the lower level examples too. And it's possible across all of these levels and it's more meaningful when you can integrate it vertically like that. I also say stick to what you know as a language teacher or as an instructor in the humanities. And what we know, Owen actually said it before, that language is a powerful tool and it's a cultural tool. And that environmental issues have cultural meaning and cultural significance. This is what we know. We're, I'm not a renewable energy solar panel installer. I'm a German instructor. So how can I talk about these issues? Don't feel like you can't be empowered to, to bring up these topics in class because there are cultural and linguistic elements to these problems. 
we already talked about all the different ways your your book probably includes chapters that you could tweak to focus more on sustainability. And I also want to say that if you're just starting out, small interventions are great. They're good. They're wonderful. Do that. Don't feel like you have to overhaul an entire course or an entire curriculum. You can just start with small examples. I posted our website in the chat before, and we worked with a colleague. She's a graduate student uh, in Wisconsin, Nicole Fisher, and her one of her activities, she calls it a Denkanstoß in German. It's just like a thinking moment. And why not start a class with, okay, for five minutes, write down everything you associate with bicycling. And then you would get those interesting intercultural, multicultural comments, depending on where your students are from. So these small interventions are good. And the last thing I'll say is about upper level classes. I'm very lucky to also get to teach literature courses. And I, because I do environmental humanities, mine are always kind of eco-criticism in disguise. So I just finished teaching a class on catastrophe and natural disaster. And we looked the whole time at humans and non-humans in these texts, or someone brought up I think it was Maria brought up migration before. Migration is always tied to place. So how can we think about migration through the lens of place or add that in there as well? So I hope I hope that's encouraging, but I also offer my stubbornness to anyone who needs it and who wants to uh, try and make some changes in their programs. Thank you. Any more contributions on that or? Uh, should we open the floor to uh, our participants uh, to ask any questions and make any contributions that they wish to? Just quickly, I wanted to say that I uploaded a document for, from UNESCO, which is a, a document created for any instructor, professors, teachers who want to develop um, sustainable development education. It's not related to foreign languages, but it has been extremely helpful to me to, to um, decide on learning um, goals for uh, my classes and to uh, incorporate different topics of sustainability. So I think it's a very valuable document for anybody to, to have. Yeah, you I agree that. Framework. Yeah, combined with the, the SDGs websites, um, which explain the different SDGs and combined with that UNESCO document, it's, uh, it's very useful to start generating ideas on how to incorporate it into our teaching. Would anybody like to uh, make further contributions or ask questions? I want a quick reply to Owen's question about how to get teachers on board just from the last, the, the penultimate kind of big question. Um, one thing that we have more probably in the US than in other countries is a decent culture of climate deniers still um, who might be in our classes. And so, um, and it tracks somewhat to the kind of institution. So Kylie and I teach at a kind of elite small liberal arts college and most of our students probably don't come from that background. But our colleague Dan Nolan teaches at a kind of regional public university that draws students from a lot of different backgrounds. Um, and he teaches a sort of he, he teaches a sustainable development class, basically. And there are students who come into the class really skeptical of what he's doing. And he goes about it in terms of just like, I'm not interested in. I'm not going to change your politics, that's not my goal, but there are problems going on that all of us are interested in trying to solve. And you need to find a problem that you can frame within the context of this class and we're going to work on it together. Um, and that I'm thinking about sort of the bicycle example in South Africa, like there are things that simply do not transfer. And so having a couple of case studies to introduce and then like passing it over to have the students or have the colleagues produce their own problems to work on, I think can can be really effective, even if they start out thinking they simply don't agree with the framework of the class, because it can then be framed in a way where they can still do work that they think is is valuable. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, it's it's been a really interesting conversation, I find. Um, uh, one thing that I find I struggle with is how to uh, bring 
uh, what we do, so, you know, um, both Pilar and I and some of our colleagues uh, as well in TU Dublin in languages uh, try and bring some of the sustainability issues into our classes, but it's, it's um, and that works very well, but for me, it's how to move from that uh, language classroom to uh, the external world, the real life world, and to maybe, I suppose, it uh, how to make that con it part of perhaps an assessment to some extent, um, so that it becomes an integral part of the curriculum. And uh, that, and, and I think for that, um, one idea that uh, was mentioned here today, I think came from Seth, and the, the this idea of working with German partners um, on and business partner, partners to see we sort of to try and bring back some best practice from the, the, the foreign language country uh, into uh, into the, the industry or the business uh, in one's own country um, is, is, is something that I'm going to look further into. Um, but I, I don't know if if um, if 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 you have any more to say on that on that point of uh, really um, creating that bridge, you know, because it, it's there's a lot going on. Like there's the there's the language teaching, there's the SDGs, there's this whole systems thinking, future proof thinking, collaborative work, um, cognitive. Maria Jose, you outlined it very well at the start. All the different skills um, that are required, um, the norm. Uh, setting changes as well, like the way the mindset stuff we need to change uh, to bring all of this together and then uh, and then try and have our students actually um, uh, make it real in their in their everyday lives. Uh, but at the same time, part of this curriculum um, is a big challenge, really, I find. Um, and I, I, I guess, Kylie, you're right. Take it step by step, start small. But then once you have started small and you want to go a little bit bigger, it's, you know, trying to find ways to channel that is, is a challenge. I have a few um, examples I'll put into the chat, but I think my quick answer to that is that brings in a whole additional field of, of civic engagement or academic civic mm -hmm. engagement or service learning, as, as it's been various, variously called, um, where building partnerships is super complicated because our timeline in the university, our priorities, the power level of a university versus um, a community partner is, is not equal and is not the same. Um, and so thinking about how to do that in a way that is is ethical and productive for everybody is, mm -hmm. is complicated. Um, but there are lots of people who are thinking about how to do it. Campus Compact is an organization mm -hmm. based in the US that's that's their primary focus. And there are a couple mm -hmm. of others that I'll see if I can find and put in the chat. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think maybe if nobody is uh, uh, wanting, uh, Carmen wants to say something as well, please. Okay, thank you. Yes, I think there is also Elena who wants to say something. Uh, I just want to react to what Kili, if I pronounce it correctly, when she said that when you said that we need to be stubborn and we need to continue. Uh, uh, and I really appreciated that. I'm uh, quite older than you, but uh, I can tell you that I, start, I started being so stubborn many, many years ago. And I know that we don't have so many uh, resources, but uh, we can create our own resources. Even in Italian, answering back to Juliana, I read her, uh, her message. I mean, there are so many things that we can search for and then use in the classrooms and encourage the students to analyze and think about and become aware. One very simple example that I use pretty often is uh, uh, one song by Cat Stevens. Uh, this uh, date, dates back to uh, um, the 80s. Uh, uh, so at that time, uh, I can't remember his name now, but at that time, his name was Cat, Cat, Cat Stevens. Um, where do the children play? Read the lyrics, watch the video. 
and it's an incredible an incredible input uh, an incredible way to um encourage the students uh, to you know to react to think to add and then uh, when you when you uh, involve young people it is incredible the way how uh, the the new uh, ideas uh, even in a second language uh, that they can give us so yes i agree with you stubborn <laughs> and, and did you say elena wanted to come in as well i can see yes yes, yes. if i can uh, add just a little bit i teach uh, future journalists in prague charles university and we use a database of curated stories there are solutions journalism stories i'm not sure whether you're familiar with the concept of solutions journalism it's a kind of a new branch of journalism that is showing solutions not just fluff stories not just you know something uh, just so that it's positive like somebody uh, saved a, a kitten but it's really uh, dealing with some social issues. It has several categories like mental health or public health or promoting democracy, you know, different, different categories. And I think the biggest one is the climate change solutions. So please look into it. I have posted a link. Uh, there is a curated database or a database of curated stories called Solutions Story Tracker. And I've put the link in the chat. I said that there are 14,000 stories, but then I checked and there are now uh, 15,600 curated stories in this database. And they're already in Spanish and in French as well. So the bulk is in English, but um, I didn't know, but I just checked. There are some in, uh, in French and Spanish. So, you know, French uh, language teachers and Spanish language teachers can also benefit from it. But the bulk is from the U.S. because that's where uh, that's where solutions journalism started. But we're promoting it in Europe as well. Um, and maybe if you want to look into it, it is something you know new that is giving hope to people. And uh, I think it's really needed. And maybe your students could uh, really benefit from it as well. Thank you and very if much. I can if I can maybe just say one more thing, I have uh, bonded with um, the Faculty of Sciences. Uh, this was two years ago or three years ago. So uh, we're uh, the Faculty of Social Sciences where we teach future journalists and we collaborated with the students from the Faculty of Sciences who are like experts on the environment. So uh, we were choosing together some stories from this database that could be applicable for our country because there are stories from, you know, all across the, the globe. And uh, the students from the Faculty of Sciences were kind of helping whether, you know, it would make sense in our country as well. And then we uh, actually uh, published the best stories that would work in, in the Czech Republic. Uh, and we published them uh, on a national uh, national platform called econews.cz. So like really maybe helping finding some solutions as a part of the language lesson and uh, really maybe showing a solution that works somewhere else mm -hmm. that could be could be used here as well yes empowering students and maybe mm -hmm. um, being uh, conscious as well of that eco anxiety that we can generate in students if we focus too much on all the negativity connected to the sdgs so it's a, it's a very um positive input uh, thank you, Elena. And maybe, maybe um, also really like uh, moving the story to the public because, you know, uh, other people could read it and maybe some people who can, you know, make some changes really in real life could read the story and uh, like moving the, the solutions to the public. Mm -hmm. So it's not just academic, it's not mm -hmm. just language learning or, you know, language teaching, but it's also practical. So making a change, maybe. Yes. So making hoping, that connection. Hoping that, to making a change. Yeah. That connection. Right. So with the, the really link like. is there and I highly recommend it. Solutions Thank you. Story Tracker. You're welcome. Well, 
that was a really interesting uh, discussion, fascinating. You've really brought us on a, on a journey of exploration uh, on how to empower our students, um, our language students especially, uh, with not you know, going well beyond the linguistic proficiency that we all try to uh, have them achieve, but uh, also with the with the knowledge, the skills, the attitudes, and uh, the um, different values that are needed to uh, contribute meaningfully in uh, in uh, in this uh, difficult world that we all face. Um, and I think the term meaningfully is is very important because um, you know there's always that danger danger with sustainability, which is now the catch-all phrase uh, in many uh, forum or fora, uh, is to um, I suppose uh, just to do a tick the box exercise. And uh, I think we've gone well beyond that this evening. And uh, we've really touched on so many ways of uh, making uh, sustainable sustainability and sustainable uh, development education uh, meaningful in our uh, in the curricula of our language uh, students. So thank you very much for that. Um, and I hope you all enjoyed it. And we will wish you a very good weekend and a good. Um, um, I have I have just a practical question, just my own ignorance. How do I make sure that I can access the chat and all the resources? I, I think we need to make sure to export the chat before the Zoom meeting closes, and we will then circulate uh, the recording and the the chat but i think we'll also get back to you with a few more ideas uh with the guest speakers in particular um on on how to promote this event and uh, and this uh fruitful conversation thank you all for attending and taking your time on a friday afternoon and evening and making it a longer event than initially planned <laughs> But I think it was well worth while. Yeah, it was. It was great. Thought provoking. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Thank you. Thank you. And sorry for being late. <laughs> yeah. Much oh. <laughs> Thank you, Paloma. Thank you, Mirna. Oh.